Well, what does it mean to be loved infinitely? That's the answer we're after today. And to get the answer, we must first understand that God, for a time, passed over sin. He simply passed over it. He didn't bring final judgment on sinners in real time. He would deal with sin finally, but only later in the cross. Meanwhile, in the thousands of years of human history prior to the cross, God would show his forbearance. We read about this in Romans 3, verses 22 to 26, where Paul writes this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. End quote. This text is loaded with theology and meaning, and it answers this question of what it means to be loved infinitely. Here now is Pastor John preaching in Austin, Texas on January 1st, 1998 to explain. The problem is that he passed over sins. He just passed over them. Let me give you another illustration. I'll make this up out of my own head. Suppose there were anarchists who in their shrewdness and their technological prowess want to blow up the White House and kill the president and blow up his cabinet and kill all the leaders and throw America into chaos. But owing to some very careful counter espionage, they are detected in the last minute and there's an averting and the part of the White House that blows up does not have the president in it. He escapes, many others die. And these anarchists are found. Most of them are kept alive as the machine guns settle down and they're, and they're brought to trial for treason, the highest crime in the American Constitution. Now, what would it say to the nations, all of whom are watching, just as all the nations are watching or will be watching someday, as God goes on to the throne as judge and the nations are gathered before him. What would it say if the panel of judges said, well, since this is your only only time of being caught like this, we'll let you all go. In fact, we'll clothe you and we'll provide you vacations and if you really want to ruin the analogy, eternal happiness. What would the nation say about the esteem with which we hold our president? It would say we don't value him very highly. And the security and coherence of this government is not a big deal to us. And that's what it would say about God. If he can just forgive you and let bygones be bygones, And nothing happened. But that's not what happened. He did not spare, but rather he put his son forward to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance he had passed over sins previously committed, it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous. Now, God could have done it another way. He could have sent all of us to hell, and the score would have been even. And eternal suffering would have been an even score to sin. Because sin committed against an infinitely holy God is an infinitely heinous act, and therefore deserves an infinitely long and painful suffering. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And therefore, there is between God and hell a mediator and a savior. 
And God, in crucifying his son, vindicated his glory for all who will hide in this Jesus and say, Jesus and his name and his glory and his worth are my only hope of right standing with a holy judge. The foundation of your salvation is God's love for his glory. God wants you saved, but he wants something more than that. He wants his name to be honored. He wants his righteousness to be vindicated. He wants his holiness to be established. And thus it cost him his son to preserve the glory of his name in saving sinners. One last question. Is this love? Is a God-centered crucifixion loving toward me? Or only toward God? The question betrays the world mindset. You know why? It assumes that for us to be loved, God must make us the center. Check yourself here. Right here, the message is coming down. It's coming down to a test in your heart. When you look at the cross, do you love the cross because it makes much of you or because it enables you, an ungodly person, to enjoy making much of God? I wish I could make this land on you because if you were to agree that the point of the cross is not to make much of you, but to enable you, in spite of hell-deserving sin, to enjoy an eternity of making much of God. If you agree with that, you will be so out of step with this culture, you will scarcely be able to watch television without weeping. You will scarcely be able to sit in secular university classrooms without breaking inside at the almost universal assumption that makes nonsense out of the cross. So test yourself here. I plead with you because evangelical Christianity is profoundly contaminated with this mindset. Book after book, message after message, making the cross an echo of my excellence and thus making it unintelligible for what it really is. I believe that the love of God comes to its apex in the cross of Jesus for me and you. Because... I define the love of God for me as that act by which, in spite of all my sin, He takes me and makes me able to enjoy infinitely His making much of God. That is what love is, which is why many of you need to be drenched with the love of God right now in a way vastly different than you thought when you were singing those songs. Because you've been taught all your life long that self-esteem is the bottom line of all virtue and all health and all being lovedness. And it is not God esteem. Why do you go to the Grand Canyon? Why do you go to the Alps? Do you really go to the glories of creation to see how great you are? Tell me about it as you stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon. You go there because you were made to see, behold, and enjoy greatness. And the Grand Canyon is nothing compared to God. You were made for God and you will find yourself loved when you awaken to the truth that to be loved infinitely is to be forgiven, cleansed, 
and enabled to see and to feel the wonder that God makes much of God. Amen. Absolutely phenomenal point. No one goes to the Grand Canyon to increase his self-esteem. Pastor John has, uh, over the years, put some qualifiers around that statement about the Grand Canyon. You can see that, for example, in APJ 128, if you want more. But still, this point holds. We are loved infinitely by being freed by God to make much of Him. So critical. This sermon clip came to us from an Aggie, Sarah Jane. This message was preached at Passion in Austin, Texas on January 1st, 1998. Sarah Jane writes in, quote, Pastor John, thank you so much for the innumerable ways you have impacted my life through your preaching and teaching. I first heard of you when I began as a student at Texas A&M University in the fall of 1998. Earlier that year, you preached this sermon at Passion 98. Although I wasn't present for the initial splash, the ripple effects of that day carried on in Austin through digital copies of your sermon. I must have listened to this sermon at least 20 times throughout my undergrad and graduate school years. It completely changed the way I thought about self-esteem versus God-esteem and answered how a just God could offer complete forgiveness to sinful people like me. Thank you for your faithful preaching of God's truth to my generation. May the ripple effects continue for many more to come. End quote. Amen. Thank you, Sarah Jane, for that testimony. Thank you for the clip. The entire sermon is available at DesiringGod.org. It's titled, Did Christ Die for Us or for God? Great sermon clip. All our clips are now crowdsourced. You tell us what bits of Piper sermons changed your life, and we share that clip with the APJ audience. If you got one, email me. Give me your name, hometown, the sermon title, the timestamp of where the clip happens in the audio, and tell me how it impacted you. Put the word clip in the subject line of an email and send it to me at AskPastorJohn at DesiringGod.org. That's an email address, askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. We are back Friday to look at spiritual warfare, particularly why does it seem that our spiritual battles are so often mediated through flesh and blood, through apparent human enemies. It's an interesting topic I want you all to hear, and we will when John Piper returns to the studio with me on Friday. We'll see you then.